Evidence for the trial judge. Other crimes, wrongs, or acts. Applying Federal Rule of Evidence 404B, Part 1. Welcome once again to Evidence for the Trial Judge, a Federal Judicial Center program for United States District and Magistrate Judges. I'm Stephen Salzberg, Howery Chair of Trial Advocacy at the George Washington University Law School. In this two-part program, we'll explore some of the more troublesome legal and practical issues that arise in the application of Federal Rule of Evidence 404B. With me to discuss these issues in the context of three hypothetical cases, two criminal and one civil, are United States District Judges Vicki Miles LaGrange of the Western District of Oklahoma, and Milton Shader of the Northern District of Illinois, and Rena Raggi of the Eastern District of New York. Welcome to you all. In today's program, we'll discuss whether certain other crimes evidence should be admitted in a hypothetical criminal case, which you have in your written materials. In the second part of the program, which airs later this month, we'll discuss 404B issues in the context of both criminal and civil cases. Let's begin with a more general question. Judge Miles LaGrange, let me start with you. Uh, 404B, criminal case, government's required to provide general notice that it's going to offer 404B evidence. Uh, what do you do to get the 404B issue uh, into a position where you can rule? At the pretrial conference uh, where notice of intent to uh, offer 404B material has been made, uh, that's the first time that um, I require the government to cite uh, the specific reasons uh, for me, for the court, as well as for the defense as to why this evidence uh, should come in, to specifically identify the facts uh, for which this proffer is being made. I would add, uh, however, oftentimes that has already been done uh, as between counsel uh, in the Western District of Oklahoma. Uh, we have a, the U.S. Attorney has a, a, an open file policy. And Judge Shader, assuming you do something like the same, what do you require of the government in terms of the 404B proffer? Well, we require something more than that. We also have, uh, fortunately, an open uh, file policy that the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office practices. And I know that 404B literally just requires notice of what's called, I think, the general nature of any evidence that they intend to put in. But I, uh, in order to facilitate the pretrial ruling and indeed to inform defense counsel as well as the government and, uh, and the court in planning for trial, we tend to follow the same practice that, uh, if I can shift gears a little to the uh, uh, 801D2E situation, the co-conspirator statement, we require upfront Santiago proffers called after a Seventh Circuit uh, decision, as you might guess, of the same name although uh, we thought about changing that to Bergele. But uh, that means that we require shifting to 404B, not only specific identification of other acts, but also of the government's theory uh, for purposes of uh, which the evidence is sought to be introduced. If you look at the Federal Judicial Center's model instruction about how to deal with 404B, that essentially tends to highlight the same thing. And requiring that up front is much better, I think, for everybody who's involved in the system. Judge Raggi, do you, do you also require that kind of a proffer from the government? And then, if you do, what, how do you actually go about resolving the issue? All on paper? Do you have argument? Do you have evidence? What's the procedure? I've never had to have a hearing, an evidentiary hearing. So I guess the answer would be on paper and in oral proffers or arguments. Um, but essentially, I'm going to need three things to rule. I'm going to need to know what the other crime evidence or other bad act evidence is that the government wants to offer, what the theory is on which they're going to offer it to let me make the first analysis of whether it's being offered for a reason other than to prove bad character. And then I'm probably going to need to know how they're going to prove it because otherwise I'm not going to be able to analyze whether what they're proposing to do is more probative than prejudicial. Let me ask you a question. We have this decision um, by the Supreme Court in the old chief case, which was the felon who was charged with being in possession of a firearm, and the issue was whether he could stipulate to his felony status and, um, and therefore, uh, thereby avoid having the conviction proof. Suppose the defendant says, well, Judge, I mean, I'm really impressed in 403 um, with, in response to, a, to this 404B evidence, and 
Judge, I'm telling you, the government's got a lot of other proof in this case. They don't need this 404B evidence. The incremental probative value is small, and the prejudicial effect is as great as it always is with this kind of evidence. Do you ever reserve and say, I, I think I want, I'm going to hold off on a ruling because I want to make a 403 determination later? I have sometimes held off um, telling the government, for instance, not to open on the proffered evidence and then getting a little more of a sense of exactly what it is they are going to prove. Um, I'm always a little concerned about arguments that the government doesn't need it uh, from a defendant, but I have on occasion reserved and waited until the case developed a little more. Now, Judge Shader, you had mentioned, and I thank you for this, that it's the Santiago rule, because you know that the Bourgelet case, the Supreme Court version of that, was the one I argued and lost, and I know you're sparing me. <laughs> that was deliberately merciful. I, <laughs> yeah. And that I really appreciate it. And my question is, the Santiago <coughs> rule and the approach that you follow, I take it that th these must fall within the inherent power of the court to organize and to control as case management uh, the way in which criminal cases are conducted, just like you control civil cases. That's right. There's nothing. Uh, you can hunt the rules through, and you're not going to find anything that talks about that. Contrast, for example, Section 3500, in which Congress effectively overrode the uh, Supreme Court decision in, in the Jenks case. There's nothing that uh, prescribes the matter in that fashion, and therefore I do think it's within the court's inherent power. I think it's probably time for us to turn to our first scenario, and uh, to begin our discussion uh, of this drug distribution scenario, you'll all have a copy of the case in your written materials. But let's go over the specifics of the case briefly. In scenario one, as you can see, the charge is distribution of heroin near a school. The salient facts are that a police officer approaches the defendant to buy heroin. The defendant tells the police officer to, quote, wait over there, end quote, near a third party. The third party nods his head. The police officer approaches the third party and pays him $30 for two envelopes of heroin. The 404B evidence is that a second police officer on two occasions five and six weeks earlier approached the defendant in the same location and purchased heroin directly from the defendant. Let's begin our discussion. Judge Miles Grange, back to you. Now the first thing that's going to happen, if I heard you right, is you're going, when the counsel are in and the government said, we got We've given notice that there's going to be um, some 404B evidence, and it's going to relate to prior narcotics purchases and sales. And then the government is going to say, um, Your Honor, we need this. We're offering it to prove knowledge and intent. That's my guess. And let's assume now our first version of this is the defense lawyer, this is our assumption, responds and says, Well, Your Honor, we are not going to contest that the officer may have approached. We're not going to contest that the officer may have spoken to the defendant. But our contention is going to be that any gesture by the defendant was totally innocent. Um, and the defense lawyer says, and these other acts have nothing to do with this kind of case. There are two incidents where a police officer says he bought um, heroin from the defendant directly. There's no third party. Um, there's no steering. There's nothing like what's being charged here, so that this is not a knowledge and intent about the crime, the kind of crime that's charged in this case. Um, how do you respond? I probably let it in. Uh, the analysis that I would uh, go through, I'd obviously ask myself first, is this evidence uh, relevant to a fact other than propensity? Um, I would probably uh, come out ruling that, that it certainly is relevant uh, to uh, knowledge and intent. Um, in this case, this defendant certainly knows that this is heroin, and uh, he intends that this drug sale be made. Um, uh, then I would move to assess the probative value and uh, of that uh, 404B evidence and apply the 403 balancing test. Um, and I probably would come out um, in this hypothetical, um, with the evidence being more probative uh, than unfairly prejudicial. Well, that unfairly prejudicial part is, is important, isn't it, Judge Shader? That the emphasis is not just on whether the defendant's claiming, hey, this is prejudicial, but it's whether it qualifies as this special kind of prejudice. A lot of courts have said that, uh, that 
by definition, relevance means prejudicial. So it's unfair prejudice that 404B deals with. But it seems to me that uh, one of the problems that we always have when we talk about, for example, labels like knowledge and intent uh, has to do with intent as to what. What the defendant, I gather, is arguing here is that there's uh, no intent to conduct a heroin transaction in this particular way that's reflected in a 404B material. But the government's response is, well, that's too narrow. What we're looking at is intent to facilitate a heroin transaction as such. And in those terms, I, I agree with uh, the judge here that what we're looking at is uh, something that uh, has that meets the requisite test and isn't uh, materially or so substantially overridden by the potential for unfair prejudice that it would keep it out under 403. Judge Raggi, let me now turn to you and just say the defense lawyer who's going down the tubes here um, so far desperately knows that if this evidence comes in, it makes a huge difference, and if it stays out, it makes a huge difference. So the defense lawyer, let's say, makes the following argument to you. He says, Your Honor, now, the, whether you, my defendant can, he actually committed these other offenses has not even been proved. I mean, this is another police officer who says it's my defendant, but assuming that he did, the only evidence you have before you is that my guy's greedy. My guy sells drugs and keeps all the money for himself. The kind of transaction that we have so, you know, we have charged in this case is that another party has the drugs, another party's making the sale, another party's getting the money, and that the def my guy, the defendant, is somehow steering. And that that's a very different kind of transaction, a very different kind of crime, and it requires a partner, and there's absolutely no evidence that in the other transactions that my guy knew anything about partnerships, that he had any knowledge of how to work with somebody else, or that he had any intent ever to work with another person. It's just so different. Am I going to get anywhere? Probably not. Similarity of the other act is a relevant factor for the court to weigh in deciding whether to let in this kind of evidence. But we're not talking about something as dissimilar as a mail fraud or a robbery or something very different. We're talking about two drug crimes. And the issue before the jury is going to be when the first officer comes up and uses a street term to buy drugs, and this defendant doesn't say what. Um, he tells him to go right across the street. Whether the issue is going to be, what did he know the officer was interested in, and what was his intent when he sent him across the street? Well, the other two acts, though somewhat different, um, the first one does involve the defendant engaging in discussions with another individual at the very same site. And I think that raises enough questions about whether this site is a general place to offer drugs and the defendant and others are selling there to let it go to a jury. So I, I don't think the argument is going to persuade me to keep the, ev the evidence out. Uh, Judge Shaver, I want to go back and ask another question. There's an argument that often gets made. This evidence looks like it's coming in. But suppose the government, instead of making the intent argument, which has been persuasive to all three of you, suppose the government said, it's background, Your Honor. Here's what reason we're offering the other two acts is. It shows why police officer in the case charged, why he approached this defendant as opposed to anybody else. It's because he knew about the other guy having, on two prior occasions, bought narcotics. Would that be a persuasive reason to get this in? If I could encapsulate that explanation in a word, it would be propensity, and the answer would be no. It seems to me that the government has to pick uh, not just a general label or something off the laundry list that 404B contains, or something imaginative, because 404B is not all-inclusive, but rather an apt label, one that fits, if I can use a term from still another Supreme Court decision. Uh, and so I, I think the answer to that is no. Judge Miles LaGrange, do you agree with that? I do. Are we unanimous? I do. In fact, I think that the whole reason that the government is allowed to put in background evidence of other crimes is so that it's not put in the unfair position of having a jury wonder how two people are dealing in 10 kilograms of heroin on a street corner on a given afternoon out of the blue. Some background is necessary to explain that, but this is not the kind of hypothetical where, a, where background evidence is really needed to be fair to the government. Well, I'm going to stay with you for a second because I think if we change our scenario slightly to go to the second version, that we may have a difference here 
um, of views depending on what circuit we happen to, to be located in. Instead of making this claim about the gesture was innocent, defense lawyer says, Your Honor, we're going to defend this case on the theory that the officer never approached this defendant. He never had a conversation. Nothing happened. That's our defense. And now we ask you, please exclude these other acts because they no longer are sufficiently probative on our claim that none of this ever happened. Now, are my chances, if I'm the defense lawyer, of keeping this out, are my chances of getting any better? In the Second Circuit, your chances have improved considerably because if the defense is that it didn't happen, then he's not arguing that he didn't have the requisite intent, he didn't have the requisite knowledge. It's that the officer is lying about what happened on the scene that day. That's going to be enough in the Second Circuit to keep it up. A prosecutor will try to nail that down by asking for a stipulation that knowledge and intent will not be in the case. Indeed, he may ask for a concession that the judge will charge the jury that knowledge and intent are not issues in the case. And Judge Shader, now let's go to, to, to your court. Same thing, same scenario unfolds, and now the government says, but judge, you know, before the defendant offers to stipulate anything, they say, it's, we got to prove knowledge and intent. It's an element of our case. What happens? Seventh Circuit is much likely to be more sympathetic to that perspective. Indeed, they can probably point to something in, in uh, old chief in support of that uh, proposition, but the smart prosecutor is still going to ask for the stipulation uh, because you don't want to take a chance, I would think, in that situation on the prospect of uh, that being the, the rule and, heaven forbid, uh, you know, if from the prosecutor's perspective, if there's an acquittal, the prosecutor can't take that up. Charles Miles LaGrange, in this second version, the, when the defendant's saying none of it ever happened um, and therefore I move to exclude, are, are you more sympathetic to the argument to keep this evidence out? I am, uh, in that instance, more sympathetic to it. You have a defendant uh, saying in the second hypothetical, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. So the reason why the government proffered the 404B evidence in the first place, uh, knowledge, intent in particular, um, becomes a non-issue. What if the following happens now? <coughs> what if the, you say, um, to the defendant, are you going to contest knowledge and intent? And the defendant says, no, we're just saying it never happened. And the defendant says, we're willing to stipulate knowledge and intent that, that if, if this would have happened, then somebody would have had knowledge and intent, but didn't happen. And then case gets tried, closing argument. Defense lawyer gets up and says to the jury, look, he said, you've heard the prosecution's evidence. We submit that uh, it didn't happen. The officer wasn't telling the truth. And, even, and furthermore, the officer, if the officer had ever walked up to anybody on the street, maybe the officer said something, maybe it was never heard. You know, maybe the officer was in the vicinity, but the, the defendant didn't see him, didn't know there was any conversation going on, and therefore there was no crime. Is that a violation of the stipulation? Can the defense lawyer do that in closing argument, having already given away knowledge and intent? I think not. I don't, I don't think he can have it both ways. Um, and, and if I understand your reworking of the hypothetical, that's what, what you're asking um, the defendant to do. I sort of am, and I guess I may not be the most, may not be the most artful way, but I guess I'm asking the question, Judge Hader, is how closely do you hold the defendant, if you've kept this stuff out to the detriment of the government, to making sure they don't try to go through the back door and hint to the jury somehow that, you know, that there's another theory the jury could consider? When this issue or an issue like it arises, something in which a ruling is dependent on a position that's been advanced by counsel, and this goes whether it's prosecutor or defendant, uh, defense counsel, what I tell them is you're out in terms of the ability to argue this in front of the jury. You've made a commitment. You've made a commitment to the court. It's your professional responsibility not to advance something that's inconsistent with that. Uh, and uh, to date, I've never had the occasion to figure out what happens if notwithstanding that admonition, they violate it. But I make it very plain up front. Um. Judge Raggi, have you had a case where maybe it didn't come up in closing argument, where you initially kept stuff out? The defendant, you, it appeared, was not going to contest knowledge and intent, and suddenly, in the course of the defense case or the cross-examination, 
the defendant did something and, and you said now it's, co it's coming in on rebuttal. I, I have had the type of situation where I've reserved because I've been somewhat skeptical of whether a defendant really could defend the case without putting knowledge and intent in issue. And I've had all the representations that no, they would not be an issue. And then as the case has gone along, my skepticism <laughs> proved uh, right and the issue was put before the jury, then I've let the government go ahead and put in the similar act evidence. But Steve, the problem, of course, arises as to when that happens. If the trial goes along in accordance with the representation and then it's tried to be injected at the time of closing argument, it's a much different situation from the one in which the judge can ha take a second look at it, as uh, Judge Raji has indicated. That, I think, uh, probably all of us would, would do. But it's a terribly difficult problem, as I say, if it comes at that late stage. And thank goodness, uh, not having had to face it, I don't know what the answer to that one is. See, I haven't had it, but I assume it would draw an objection and you'd probably sustain the objection and give an instruction there. And this is why the government wants a charge. They want right. the next thing that the jury hears to be the judge telling the jury that these are not issues for their consideration. In, uh, judge Miles LaGrange, if in some cases the defendant um, pretrial is, want, is trying to keep a fluid position, they're just, they're, they don't have a strong defense, they're just looking for what it is they're going to try to put forward. And if they say to you, Your Honor, we deny on all the elements of this, they don't say anything as specific as our first scenario. They don't say it was, if there was a gesture, it was a mistake. They say we deny all the elements. We're back, I take it then, where you're going to let the evidence in. Probably. And, and one Probably. That's what makes these 404 be. Uh, uh, situation so so very difficult. I mean, it's such a thin line there. Um, you know, evidence which is uh, relevant to uh, a consequential fact other than propensity also um, is evidence which arguably shows a propensity. So you, you end up, I oftentimes, uh, when I'm confronted with 404B problems, end up uh, reverting to questions of, is it fundamentally fair? to allow this evidence in. Well, on, on the set, when you're thinking about fair, and you're thinking about how you're going to strike this balance, Judge Shader, let me just change our facts if I can slightly. Let's suppose that the two events we're talking about, the prior sales there, five months earlier approximately, approximately a week apart. Suppose the defense lawyer says, Your Honor, he's not guilty of those. Not guilty of this one, and he's not guilty of those. We're going to ha put on 10 eyewitnesses to say he wasn't there, it, that he has a look-alike who hangs around the neighborhood and they got the wrong guy on the other occasions and that we're going to end up with three trials in one trial. And, that, and we can give you names of the witnesses if you want, but that's what this is going to be about, that they haven't convicted him of anything yet, um, and that should go into the balance. If in good faith the defense lawyer makes that kind of presentation, does that go into the balance? Well, it's really hard to treat with that, uh, it's, it's much the same as the effort to, uh, to limit uh, character evidence on the theory that you're, you don't want to have many trials within many trials within trials. Uh, it seems to me that that does become a factor that you're entitled to take into account. The idea that, uh, that the possibility of that sort of thing is like more likely to lead the jury into determining whether the defendant was guilty of the other offense, which is, after all, the reason we keep propensity evidence out to begin with, seems to me to bear importantly on whether the matter ought to be included uh, as a result of the 403 balancing. Judge Raji, let me ask you, it, the reverse of this is, suppose the defendant had pleaded to these, guilty. So you, you had a guilty plea and you had basically the equivalent of beyond a reasonable doubt proof of guilt as to the two prior occasions. Does that go into the balance as in terms of uh, whether it's convenient to prove and therefore that also is something you take into account when you decide whether you're going to let this evidence in? I suspect it does. Um, one is eager to try the case on trial, not some other case. So if the similar act evidence is going to come in very nice and cleanly, one has less concern. Um, the hypothetical you put to Judge Shader where it becomes a trial. I think the court starts to look at what's going on um, in terms of 
how much of the trial time is now going to be occupied trying the similar act. Um, I, I think it would play a part. And back to you, Judge Miles LaGrange. The, we're going to uh, have occasion to look at two other scenarios later. One is another criminal scenario and one is a uh, civil one. And all of these differ. I mean, the nuances differ. And, and how hard do you find the 404B slash 403 issues to be on terms, in terms of you look at all the evidence issues you're called upon to decide, all the, the calls you have to make before and during a trial? I mean, on the scale of importance and difficulty, how do you place these? I would say that, that the 404B determinations that I'm called upon to resolve are among the more uh, challenging uh, evidentiary matters. Um, and again, it is because of that, that kind of thin line between um, evidence which is relevant to uh, a consequential fact other than propensity, evidence which would show, for example, knowledge or intent or opportunity, motive, plan. That evidence, off, that type of evidence oftentimes is very similar to evidence which clearly shows propensity. Uh, or the likelihood of, that an individual, that the defendant, you know, acted in conformity with that evidence. Well, Judge Hader, you've been doing this e even longer than Judge Miles LaGrange, and, and how hard do you find these? Well, I share the, the notion that they're, uh, that they're hard, and it seems to me that one thing we don't often think about is that uh, there's an inherent problem with the whole premise of 404B. That is, uh, it's counterintuitive. Uh, all of us, I think, believe that somebody else who's committed a crime is uh, once is probably more likely to commit another one. Uh, recidivism is uh, what that's all about. But the law has created a barrier to that, uh, and that's because the law has a concern that somebody can be convicted because of the prior offense, the same thing that I mentioned in that last hypothetical you gave, not because of this one. Now, that's a concept that's awfully difficult to explain to a non-lawyer, sometimes I think it's difficult even to explain it to ourselves, but I think that that's at the root of how, uh, how we find the difficulties with this. So, Dredge, the last question for this segment um, is yours. It's the same question about the importance of these rulings, and when, you, when you're called upon to make them, you know that 404B evidence can be misused as character evidence. You know that a defendant could be convicted just because he or she is a bad person. Um, that they, it could have that impact. You also know that it's hard to prove things like knowledge and intent. I mean, do you worry about these rulings? Uh, it, are they on the scale of wary? Um, do they rank high um, in your court? Well, I'm an Olympic class warrior, but <laughs> I can't say that, um, that this causes me any more anxiety than a lot of other rulings, um, perhaps because I have to make them a lot. And so it's not the rare case in which I'm presented with a 404 question. There are two things that sometimes go through my mind, one of which is actually not the concern of the judge, and that's second-guessing the prosecutor's strategy. I mean, in the hypothetical we have, I am totally perplexed as to why these other acts only six weeks earlier are being offered as prior acts as opposed to simply being indicted and charging the fellow with the three acts. Um, but as I said, that's really not the judge's concern. What is the other thing that goes through my mind and I think can cause some anxiety is that we are relying on proffers made by the government as to how they're going to prove these acts, by the defense as to what they're going to limit themselves to in the defense. And then we know that all the rules will be off when we get into the dynamics of a trial. And yet we're trying to decide whether what's going to happen is going to be more probative than prejudicial. And I guess it's that that will often lead me to wait before I give a final ruling and to be perhaps a little more conservative in not having the government rush in with the evidence, unless I'm really sure it's going to be on a material matter other than propensity. Well, it seems to me that we've done this scenario as well as we can do it. And I think that um, I th we should declare that this particular session is over. <laughs> We'll discuss the remaining scenarios in our second program, which will air later in the month. On behalf of the Federal Judicial Center, 
I'd like to thank Judges Vicki Miles LaGrange, Rena Raggi, and Milton Shader for being with us today, and also thank you for watching. We hope you'll take a moment to fill out the program evaluation form in your materials, as your feedback is important to us and plays a vital role in the design of these programs. Thanks again, and good day.